I would adjust the title so people don't read ahead of me. <laughs> Very powerful axioms. Why do why you don't like in the uh, infinities? Why why would you like to exclude infinities? Because I can't imagine infinities. <laughs> do you think that is sufficient argument? <laughs> Maybe this would be argument to include infinity, yeah. <laughs> not because of that. The role of natural numbers is infinite. Uh, see, I don't have to say that the ideas are true. I say the hypotheses. Exactly. No, no. I, I'm asking, why do you accept this specific hypothesis, not opposite? <laughs> you even start. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, many people do take the opposite, and then I don't have a story. You know, <laughs> this is my story. Um, because uh, I... There are no examples of infinities in physics that we know of. There are no examples of infinities in physics that we know of. Um, people assume that you know, if the universe is if dark energy is given to the universe is part forever, then there's an infinite future. Mm -hmm. But uh, I reject that. I, 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 I consider that as unreasonable, and uh, I can't imagine it forever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so this is an old problem of continuum which started in ancient Greece, actually. Already Democritus. That's why Democritus introduced atoms, by the way. Because he cannot, exactly by this reason, Democritus cannot imagine, uh, could not imagine that uh, the matter is continuous. Mm -hmm. That's why he introduced atoms. From very rational, it was a hypothesis based on exactly this argument. It's unthinkable. Infinity is unthinkable, so matter should be structured by some certain pieces of atoms. Or, or space in terms of a, a, a space. Plank, the plank length, it, the space is uh, not continuous and smooth. Uh, not smooth this, this paradox of Achilles uh, and the turtle, it also uh, brings you to the problem of continuum, actually. But, but that's mathematics. For Greeks, it was the same. It's, well, yeah. Achilles and the turtle are physically. I certainly, I say, and uh, infinities live in the world of mathematics. And, all sorts of different infinities in mathematics, mm -hmm. Google, Google Plex, and so on and so forth. But, uh, and, and mathematics can have a continuum. Mm -hmm. But what about in physics, what about electromagnetic field? That is a continuous field, or mm -hmm. the side field is... But then we still reject singularities in this field. Yes. Even if we're talking yes. about I electron, like... I we, reject. At some point we're saying it's not a really point, and it's not a singularity, it's like some really small object or whatever, yeah. and this kind of reject your infinities again. Right. Because I mean Because by rejecting infinities I also reject <coughs> infinite decimals. Anything mm -hmm. zero exactly. size, no zero size. But that's a nature of topology because like infinitesimally small elements they kinda the same with infinite with very big objects. It's just like inversion. Right. On a right. If if you if you if you if you have uh, no infinities you have no points. The absolute points. So an electron, I mean, electrons are not point like um, even photons. Photons too. I mean, at least uh, we don't know, but we, we uh, the supposition is that if it's some scale not far above the Planck scale, they are string like or something like that. Do uh, you want me to start? Should I start? Um, yes. You're not recording yet. Are you? Recording. Oh, you are recording. Okay. All right. So, so let me let me start. Are you looking at this? So yeah, so we've already started talking about this. So I'm I'm going to talk about this idea, which is actually quite old with me, but I formulated it in a way which I think, from two simple hypotheses, that of course are debatable, but if they take them as true, then you 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 arrive at a particular type of cosmology that I think is uh, is reasonable. I'm talking in a philosophical society because I've what physicists and some of them say that's philosophy because we can't disprove your idea physics wise. But so the first one is there are no infinities in physics and therefore no infinitesimals as you say. So so you can't have infinite space. Anything anything uh, that I say about doesn't have infinities. If it did, then um, then that's not part of the story here. And the other one is that no boundaries to space time. So um, when I say infinities live in a world of mathematics. Uh, fine, but mathematics and physics are not the same. Einstein suggested already back in 1905 or whenever that space may be, a bit later than that perhaps, but space may be finite and without boundaries, closed space, like the surface of the Earth is a closed two-dimensional surface. You can travel in any direction along the surface and eventually you get back where you started without having 
left the surface. There's no edge to it. Uh, we didn't fall off the edge of uh, the edge of the world when we sailed across the Atlantic. Um, but he, and and then and he and Minkowski invented the concept of space time. That time is like a fourth dimension, but unlike the others, it has um, in the, in the constant c. It has uh, i square root of minus one, so that so that um, space-like intervals are x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c minus ct squared. So uh, it's not unnatural to consider space time as finite and without boundaries as well. That is closed, and um, I don't think that that this was considered by Einstein and Minkowski. But maybe they did, but I didn't find out about it. I don't think they did, and I don't know why they didn't. But uh, as I say, time is not like space. It's somehow orthogonal to them. But not in the sense that these three space coordinates are orthogonal to each other. So, um, but let's, if you take those as, two, as true, then see what follows from them. Now, um, actually, this, 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 uh, uh, let's see again. Okay, yeah, so this is an, this, this particular paper in 72 started me thinking about this. It's by Paul Davis, who you may know is still a cosmologist, uh, uh, back in 1972, and he published a note considering closed time as an explanation of the black body background of radiation. Um, and he had, um, he had a closed oscillating universe in which finite cycles of expansion and contraction from a highly compressed state follow one another indefinitely. That has been popular for a long time, but blah, 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 problems with time axis. So let's, um, I'm saying, so this is also from his figure there. And he supposed that you have a universe that's expanding and it's going to have a big crunch. And that is repeated as cycles, but for some reason he had time flowing backwards in alternate cycles. So uh, that seemed rather strange to me because what is this axis if it's not time? Um, but he did say that there's a further possibility that states A and C, in this case, are identified. If it turns the same state at the same time, so it's identified by those. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. So when you said it's uh, confusing, you said, like, time can go forward and backwards, right? Uh, I have a, like, Maybe a stupid question, but when you're considering the general relativity and you're including time into your coordinate system and you're saying that you're really living in a four dimensional world, yeah. then all equations you have for describing your theory, like the set of four differential equations for each degree of freedom, they have another time in it. It's, let's say, a parameter. It's like some new, let's say, tau instead of t, mm -hmm. which, uh, which you differentiate with respect to. And also, equation for time can be a similar one. So when he's saying about this time going backward and forward, this is a real time, the t, which is like part of our space-time world, or this is a parameter which just like we use, you know, to describe those oscillations. Let's say if you have just a rotation on a circle, uh, or, I mean, or not rotation, let's say some oscillations, it seems like you're coordinating these oscillations going back and forth. But if you look in from the point of view of this parameter, let's say your real time, in a, for example, with pendulum, then this value keep going forward, and it never can, you know, go reverse. So right. these, yeah, these, these are interesting issues, and I have later a slide about different types of time: cosmological time, entropic time, world only time, and so on. But in this, so I don't know. Exactly, he didn't define time or mental. I presume he means something like cosmological time. Right, but what is this figure? I mean, is this, what is the horizontal axis here? Because that's this parameter. So in this case, like you have some parameter tau, yeah. and you have the real time t, which is uh, just uh, two times. There are two times. I mean, that's exactly the same trick. Let's say if you have a, let's say, time dependent Hamiltonian system, you always can expand it for extra degree of freedom, and then say, okay, I have one more degree of freedom, my time is just some variable, I don't care what is that, but I will use a new tau, mm -hmm. and I will have a new time independent, like, but a little bit larger mm -hmm. uh, system, which is have now tau, which is well defined, and it's just a nice parameter, which is linearly growth or whatever, mm -hmm. and we have absolute freedom in defining this parameter, at least from mathematical point of view, right? Okay. Uh, 
Right, so that, um, maybe that's a big discussion. I, 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 and I don't remember so far, it's a long time ago, I just went a small step further because when I, when I saw this I thought, well, why is it that he brought to draw it like that? Because I would draw naturally time going from left to right and just got it going both ways. So I just wrote a note also just following off in 73, so a long time ago, and uh, it actually got some citations much later actually, uh, where I, I had uh, redrawn it this way as a like, uh, uh, like, a, a, like a fluctuation, a vacuum fluctuation, if you like, uh, uh, similar to a virtually plasmized loop in, in our vacuum. And presume there's W and two U's, <laughs> the vacuum fluctuation. So here it's, it's really just redrawing of this, but um, and time is now going in the same sense like this, because I flipped it over, and this is a typical world line of both of an electron or a fermion or a quark, whatever. The world line is continuous around there. So now, various consequences. So uh, one is that the total energy, is, we're, this is our universe, and we're here somewhere in the expansion phase. But one consequence is that it has to be collapse. Well, I'll give, a, I'll give a consequence later. But the total energy of this has to be zero, because it's closed space. It's not like a black hole, which has a gravitational field going outside the black hole. There can be no gravitational lines of force in this, or electric lines of force because because it's closed space, so nothing can get out. Um, that means that the total energy of at least this pair has to be zero. Um, and quite reasonably, uh, there's some symmetry here, maybe not, but uh, I mean, the total energy of our universe has to be zero. So in other words, the mass energy has to be compensated by, by some potential potential energy that compensates it. Um, why do you not identify A and B? I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, so uh, at, this, at that time I gave up. But, uh, so the Barnum asymmetry that we see, you know, the universe is full of matter here, um, uh, doesn't mean that you have to have a grand annihilation of matter and antimatter, because looking at this part of the diagram, you see matter lines, Barnum lines flowing in, in the Feynman Zuckerberg sense, that is antimatter. So it's that matter, antimatter, the universe, anti-universe, pair creation. So the antimatter is in, in this disjoint U bar, which is uh, not connected. They're not connected here, except at the, at the, at the points of A and B in this case. So, and, and it's just a schematic. So don't imagine that there's a distance, a large distance between these two universes. They could be uh, on top of each other. It could be even like two brains that are microns apart. In an extra dimension, but I can talk about that at that time. But brains became more familiar at that time. Um, anyway, as I said, that that uh, that that paper was pretty well ignored, except in this a review by Keith Olive on inflation in '89. He actually cited it, and uh, that sort of broke it up a little bit. And he says, "Yeah, I'll read this. The idea that the universe may have been a vacuum fluctuation has been around for long before the inflation universe." And these are the references. Now, this bit by Tryon is the one that gets lots of citations. So you've got 150 citations here. Um, called Is the Universe a Vacuum Fluctuation? Uh, and it's later than mine, but as you see, but he didn't, he didn't cite mine because he didn't know about it probably. Uh, but anyway, uh, he gets a lot of citations about this. But he's different because he didn't have closed time, he didn't have a finite time, he didn't have pair creation. What he said was that at the Big Bang, you had equal amounts of matter and antimatter produced. Um, he didn't have the total energy of the universe being zero, um, but he did. He had matter and antimatter coexisting in our universe, so it wasn't the same, the same idea. He didn't have time, finite time, closed loop time, so it wasn't really the same. So then, as you suggested, identify points A and B. So now I just have one loop, and so. Here's, here's, here's the cosmology, it's closed three space, and time is a loop here. The Fermion world lines go around like this. This is the Big Crunch Big Bang, which I identified. So uh, a Big Crunch in our far future, if you follow a world line around, then there's a Big Crunch, and that is the Big Bang. Now time, the time coordinate is, is closed like, like this, um, and what I don't mean, people sometimes think, do you mean we go round and round and round and round? No. 
This is the whole of space time. So it's not that we we happen many, many times over. Um, it's that's it. So and this is an alternative topology, which actually I, I favor, but maybe both are equally equally possible from the logic anyway. So here we have deep time where we're in a highly dilute far future and that uh, universe there, it could be in uh, 10 to the 30 years or 10 to whatever years, but very far, when you may have the universe has expanded so much um, okay. that um, you know you have one electron per cubic me megaparsec or something, whatever. Um, that depends on whether baryons decay or not. If the baryons decay, it's quite different, but if they don't, um, then, uh, and I've got another hypothesis about that, but then you know, you'd, you'd have, uh, it wouldn't be empty because rocks would not decay, they would still be around. So this is, a, this is from a notes that I have written, but it's been on my back, back draw for, for several years, actually. Um, but now if you look here at this point, you zoom in on this point, then you see uh, the creation event as being universe and universe pair creation. There's a certain symmetry there, modular entropy, which is another discussion. But uh, then, so, uh, so there are two views of this event. You could say, well, you know, in our universe we've got about 10 to the 80 quarks and leptons um, in our visible part of the universe, and they're going to collapse in the future to a very small volume and bounce, becoming the Big Bang. Um, and then that's that's one view, sort of uh, centric point of view, our point of view, the far future. Another point of view, looking at just this part of the cosmology, is that the universe and universe pair fluctuates into existence with 10 to 80 quarks and electrons going into one direction and 10 to the 80 anti quarks and anti electrons going in the other direction, which contain exactly the same number of quarks and electrons that are flowing against the time stream of the cellular Stuckelberg binding sense. Um, so it's two different ways of looking at that. Um, and uh, there's another hypothesis which is not necessary for the topology, I think, but, but you can make that, say, the Fermi world lines are endless. So there's no end to a world line of a Fermi or quark, or lepton lines that end up separately, which is a sub-hypothesis sub of that one. Uh, so it's not essential for that, but it does have, it does have consequences if you make that. <coughs> so there is no this collapsing point? Four points are equal. What do you mean? The, the second option. In the second option. In the, the second view, you mean? Here. Yeah. So, why do you need a special point? A special point. The big, this is, I'm looking at the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang. Uh, which we go back and, you know, modern cosmology says that we all came from the Big Bang, which was. Could have been inflation from a point which was slightly smaller than a proton. But what I'm saying is that at the same, the same time, if you like, um, was, uh, you can think of it as at the same time an anti universe was created. So at the beginning of inflation, you had a u u bar being produced, total energy zero. Um, but from another point of view, the big crunch is. In the far, in our far future is is the anti universe. So it's, it's two sort of dualistic points of view. So anyway, there's consequences follow from this. So if, if these are true, then I think uh, these uh, are consequences. First, the apparent acceleration and expansion of the universe, if it's really true, must be temporary. It can't be forever because by hypothesis I don't have forever allowed and infinity is allowed. It might also be be local in space, so that our part of the universe is, is accelerating, but other parts are, are, are not accelerating, so far we are contracting. Um, again, why it should be local in space? I mean, let's say if you consider like the universe on a let's say multi-dimensional spheric manifold, then every point will accelerate from others, and it doesn't mean that it should be local somewhere. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. I don't. I don't it, it has to be local. Possibly could be local. If you think of if you think of the surface of a sphere like the Earth, okay, and imagine that it's more rubber and it's and it's 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 going up and down and bouncing. Mm -hmm. You have convex and concave areas, and some are some are convex and some are concave. So overall, you have a closed sphere, but uh, in certain regions, it's 
behaving differently. Yeah, but then suppose if you blow the air into the sphere and it is growing, right? Yeah. Then every point will like moving from other ones, and it shouldn't be like. I mean, you said it should be accelerating slower in some part of universes and like faster. I don't say it should be. I say that I can't rule that out. Can we rule that out? Okay. I don't think it should be. I I I think that that is not the likely scenario. Okay. But um, and maybe maybe cosmologists can say that that cannot be true. It has to be sort of uh, the whole of our connected universe. So here's okay. So that, that I don't think it should be. But let's say it's ruled out. The universe is closed, but maybe only just that omega parameter has to be close to one, but a little bit bigger. Um, and maybe you know that that is something maybe anthropic. So if it was you know very different from what it is, then the universe would be too, too short lived or too long lived to expand too fast and so on. So it has to be just right in the sort of anthropic viewpoint to be allowing life such as ours. So you know I think if, if you found that omega was definitely you know, 0.9 plus or minus 0.01 or something, you know, that might rule this out. And show the universe is definitely not closed. Total energy is zero, zero, as I've said, because no lines of gravity force go out. Same reason that so the charge must be zero, which has the only stable charge particle in our solar system. The second means there must be equal numbers of those. Um, so, so, in the, the normal way of account, accounting energy in cosmology, you would say that a universe that was closed had positive energy, or no negative energy. Has negative energy. Yeah. Um, the total universe has. Yeah, so gravitational binary energy plus the matter energy is. So to be closed, it has to be negative? Is yeah, it's bound in this way. Right, it's bound. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's, it's partly a matter of accounting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> but, but I mean, that's, really but that's the normal way of accounting. If we're talking about like four dimensional world, because like, the energy which is well defined, which we usually use in our life, that's a, like three dimensional energy. Because like all our equations have some restrictions that like motion is like on some, you know, like three dimensional surface or six in your phase space, whatever. But when you're talking about like gravity, all of your equation of motion includes time and energy in it. So there is like other values which is kind of giving you this invariant surface of motion, right? I mean, I'm not sure that like it's really correct to talk about like closed or open universe in sense of energy using the usual energy which we use in like in our 3D considerations, because like in 4D it have a totally different sense like the energy and some let's say invariant of motion, some you know global value which determining the motion. Of it. Let's try to keep questions short and then well, the, it's like, okay, the but discussion. So yeah. Albert, so I mean maybe. Maybe I've got a sign on or something here, but um, if you go back, I mean, what is standard cosmology thinking about, at the, say, at the, at the end of inflation or beginning of inflation, the total energy of the universe? What well, could be positive or negative? But the, the thing is that when you, in inflation, you produce a lot of gravitational binding energy and you produce a lot of matter, and they, they, can, they almost exactly cancel out. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the epsilon factor. So, <laughs> Do you mean that epsilon should be negative here? No, no. Uh, epsilon should be positive, but that corresponds to a negative right. energy and the usual way of accounting for energy. In gravity, it's hard to, you know, it's easy to talk about the space energy, the, the, the energy density of matter. That's, the, that's well understood. What is the gravitational binding energy in a non asymptotically flat space? Well, you can make different definitions. Mm. Okay, right. So. But there's a topological energy which has, you know, positive for a s closed universe, for, for a sphere, a, a, a three-sphere topology. You're talking about uh, Euclidean, asymptotically uh, Euclidean. In, 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 your, in your model, you know, you, you have two branches, right? Yeah. And, the, and the sum is zero, but yeah. it, not, not any particular, I wouldn't, I don't know why you would say that any particular branch had zero energy. Well, some, the sum would be zero. It's like an Albert vacuum function. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, in, this, in this particular view, they're, they're connected. So the, the two branches are the same internally. So yeah, but if you, you, know, so if you change the law, if you change the law, 
you change the direction of time, then yeah. then the energy changes sign. So, All right. so that the two branches would naturally cancel each other out. Well, yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah, I'm going to go think about this. And just, uh, so anyway, the other another thing is that this biogenesis, that the universe is essentially all matter, means doesn't need a mechanism like the like the grand annihilation event that we were talking about, making the photon. So that we have a photon of barium ratio, which is order 10 to 10, or something like that. And, um, and uh, that number should be explicable without this grand annihilation event. But the, the, um, the total barium number of this pair, the universe anti universe pair, is zero, of course. Um, I'm not saying you can't have a non great annihilation at the beginning, but you don't need that, because the, the, the barium asymmetry in our universe can be explained by this universe anti universe pair equation. So, the, and the old questions of what happened before the Big Bang, and the last that which happened at the beginning, and then will it have an end? They're moot questions. You can't fall off the edge of the earth either. There's no, there's no, because time doesn't have a beginning and end, it's, it's no, got no bounds, and, uh, and, and yet it's uh, finite. And then this big crunch, big bang. ECBB. It's not a singularity because it has no infinitesimals. It can be very small. It could be, it could be the size of a proton, but a slowly recent proton. Um, or it could, it could be much more than that, as in, uh, in this, uh, you know, if you have these endless world lines, then they have to be sort of threaded through this event. And actually, if uh, you have 10 to the 80 um, fermions going through, um, they each take one plane volume, which is not necessarily you have to, but then, uh, then there's uh, the micron size, the micron size. But, uh, I don't know quite how this relates to negation, but uh, I don't think it's sort of three parameters, how small you would say. Yeah. So, and the other thing is that it cannot be a singularity at the center of black holes either, for the same reason um, as you don't have a <coughs> collapse of a black hole, of matter has to start back on the Planck scale. I saw Hawking had actually said that um, it was a sort of assumption that you have a singularity. I don't think he considered proved that you have to have a singularity. Um, so then, one question is, is this physics and philosophy? So I tried out with a few physicists, including Steinhardt, uh, Bill Kane. He said, he said, four years ago, the piece is in my humble opinion, natural philosophy, not observational science. And since I can't see any way it could be by sufficient support from an experiment ever to be generally accepted. If it could be falsified by observational negative spectral curvature, if an experiment is assigned you want, that would not be enough evidence to draw that kind of conclusion. There's nothing wrong with engaging natural philosophy as well as the matter. So that's why I'm sort of using this philosophical forum, because it is sort of a philosophical in a way. So, and then let me move on to a more speculative idea about the multiverse, because as you all know, Many miracles required for life to exist, to have form, philosophers to think. Um, philosophers to exist here. For us to exist, right? Many miracles. And to be successful in the physical sense, right? Not just to exist, but. <laughs> You're a survivor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. To make this laboratory possible. Yeah, yeah, right. So no, that, that's the proton being left, and that's the neutron and so on. So, you know, in, in, my, in my humble humble opinion there, uh, it's extremely unlikely to have that um, without an extremely unlikely designer, which would be an infinite regression with the designer designer and so on. Um, so uh, you can, one, the multiverse idea is that you can have a vast number, like 10 to the enormous number, but not infinite because we don't have infinity around. Um, so it, if it's like a vacuum fluctuation, some outer space time. Um, so, and then you could have a vast number of universes, these vacuum fluctuations popping into existence and also uh, disappearing again. No connections between them, necessarily, especially they have, they have no total energy, so they don't, they don't interact gravitationally. Of course, physics in the outer space time is totally different, but there's no reason why the physics should be the same in these disconnected virtual fluctuations here. So, by the same hypotheses I used before, space time should be finite without boundaries. So you end up with a sort of toroidal picture, which is like, so that 
the, uh, the, 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 the space dimensions around here, the time dimensions around here, and then um, the number of space dimensions in our case is three. It could be two, it could be three, it could be four, in this outer space time. Um, but because these virtual fluctuations have no mass, and there's no gravitational or other, I suppose, interactions between them, space doesn't have to expand or contract as it does in our universe. And, you know, Einstein was the goal right first time in, he, in, in this outer space time. So it could be, therefore, in a steady state, not changing with time like our universe is, um, that's what's called, what's called the perfect cosmological principle, that the universe is the same not only in all places, but in all times. And uh, there was a steady state model of the universe, Hoyle, Bondi, and Gold, um, who thought the universe was in a steady state, but the universe is expanding, as if matter's being created to keep the density constant. But, uh, so maybe this other universe is in a steady state. So, as I say, there may be several of these space dimensions, but the hour of our time now is sort of irrelevant because nothing's changing. So you could, you could have it, 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 it's totally time reversal invariant, if you like, and also CEP and T invariant. Um, and then the question, you know, What's the outer universe in it? We, we don't ask that. It's a whole infinite regression. So, uh, anyway, there's been all sorts of other uh, papers relevant to this idea. I'm quite the same, but you know, Sakharov back in 67 gave conditions for the matter antimatter symmetry after the Big Bang. He said you have to have CP violation, fine number violation, and non equilibrium dynamics. Well, certainly at, at all this of them. Should be at the same time? All of them, yes. All of them required. Why not? Um, what do you mean by non equilibrium dynamics in this sense? I mean, if you're considering, let's say, oscillations of the universe, yeah. it's not really not equilibrium, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's locally not equilibrium, but. Yeah. But it my can understanding be is that, right? that at the Big Bang, you have non equilibrium, in fact, non equilibrium. I mean, now, I think the dynamics for this epoch of the universe. Would you would consider equilibrium? Can you give a definition of non-equilibrium in this sense? It's not what we standardly use in equations, right? No, I, I mean usually when you're saying like non-equilibrium, it's, 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 it's the it's not, not, not detailed balance. That's all it means. It's Does it have something to do with reversibility of time? No, it's just that the number of reactions is not always balanced by the number of inverse reactions. That's that's all it means. Okay. In a, in a highly thermalized system, they're almost exactly equal. There has to be a certain amount of being away from that equilibrium detail balance. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I say, by considering the whole W, W universe, uh, and not just our branch, then, then uh, this, this circumvent that, so you have you, you, get, you have bar number, uh, total bar number zero in, in K. And CP by well, we have CP violations, but there's not enough to give bar number symmetry. But, uh, but in, in this case, the, the anti universe branch um, can be CP, the CP is like CP, in negative CP compared to the bar group. So, so these, I think, Sakharov would. Could not argue because this is not, uh, we can't have good bar number asymmetry. And this is, by the way, Hawking, who had a no boundary proposal from a brief history of time, that book, um, which I mean, he had probably much more technical papers, but he said in this book, um, well, this is a quote from my note, but I'm quoting him. One could say the boundary condition of the universe is it has no boundary. The universe would be completely self-contained and not affected by anything outside itself. He goes on to say, I'd like to emphasize that this idea that time and space should be finite without boundaries is a proposal that cannot be deduced from some other principle. Like any other scientific theory, it may initially be put forward for aesthetic or metaphysical reasons, the real test of their metaphysical observations. And um, so he mentioned this time without boundary. I still don't agree with that exactly, but I would say that in the concept of these three theories, and in cosmology, many useful developments have not initially held accountable to this real test. Steinhardt called this metaphysical cosmology or metacosmology. 
And I said, not clear. Is there any relation between the model presented here and quantum gravity as discussed by Hawking? Now, at one point, Hawking was considered the idea that when the universe gets to its maximum size and starts to contract in the fall of dark energy, um, that the, the arrow of time reverses at that point, which is a, uh, a bit like Davis's idea, but it doesn't make any sense to me that you have at least entropic time changing sign when the universe has. But there is a year where time changed after the crunch, not after the maximum point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but actually, Hawking talked about time reversing extension of the universe before it started contracting again. Um, so yeah, you mentioned different times, and here, yeah, different times, time directions. So uh, certainly different types of time in a sense. Cosmological time, this history of expanding the universe, which is really what I've been talking about from the time up to now, is a direction of entropy increase. Shattering teacups is what Hawking talks about. Trail of I talked about last week about trail of ionization of bubble chains of it. And, um, and I added then the idea that wave function collapse time is actually equivalent to microscopic entropy jump. Um, I don't think uh, wave function collapse time. Well, I don't know. Um, and then the psychological time as experienced by us, by now, then, memories of past time. <coughs> and of course, this time has only been in sentient beings like us present. So it didn't exist before and it won't exist after. <coughs> um, and it's a complicated thing. My, my suspicion, if you like, is that this is close related to entropy increase uh, or, 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 or wave function collapse, which I think are sort of the same thing. So I can't uh, talk about that too much. And then there's world line time. It's sort of a Feynman says electrons move forward, positrons backwards. That's only convention, it could be the other way around. But you have an arrow on, on that electron moving forward. And then you have the zigzag when you have a pair creation and the positron lies, the electron and so on. Um, <coughs> and at some stage, Feynman thought, even in tongue in cheek, maybe there's only one electron in the universe and it's, uh, and it, and it's uh, jumping around and making <coughs> a sort of continuous world line. But in that case, of course, you'd have matter and antimatter all superimposed on top of each other. I think this, this is not needed for the cosmology I talked about, but if we make that hypothesis, quark and work left on world lines are continuous, they have no ends, they go around the whole loop, the whole, um, the whole loop of the universe. I think there's no evidence against this, but it would be disfalsifiable because if it's true, photons would have to be stable, photons cannot decay. Neutrinos would have to be the rat type and not my one. So if you see new neutrinos, double beta decay, that would be forbidden with this hypothesis. Um, and black holes formed from matter cannot totally evaporate into equal amounts of matter and antimatter. They must leave a core, a baryon number if they're formed from baryons. So, so I think that those are three conclusions you've reached if this hypothesis is true, which um, I don't think there's any evidence against it, is there? I don't think so. I don't, I don't really think you need the first one. Also, with an arc. I mean, it, it, I mean, baryon number or B minus L is not conserved. That's fine. I mean, if, if there's some, I mean, in the big crunch, big bang part, presumably that all work, that all work would work out. I mean, mm -hmm. since baryon number is not conserved, you you go back to a state of, I mean. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't. I know quite how you're dealing with the big bang, big crunch transition, I, but I, I have, I have, um, let's say, ten to the eighty fermion world lines coming into a big crunch, coming out of a big bang. They go through this conserved fermion world line number. All right. So, 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 one of your motivations is assuming that there is some conserved quantity that you have to explain baryon asymmetry. Right. It's it's. Um, but that but you know in the world of modern physics that's not necessarily true. It's not considered you know it's not considered a a huge contradiction that we have a baryon and baryon asymmetry. It's just well, it's just I, BSN I if, if if this hypothesis is also true 
as well as in to those two. Then, um, the Bari and cork and lepton lines weren't created at the Big Bang. They, they, they were continuous. They came through from the Big, from the, from the, from the big Crunch to the Big Bang. Continuous lines going through. Right. So, actually, I think you may be right that protons can still be decaying. They can't decay if this is true, because the photon got three quark lines, and afterwards you don't have three quark lines left. But, but this, they, would, they can't decay if this is true. No, wait a minute, I said it the wrong way around. Um, so I guess, I guess what I'm suggesting is that I think your idea of null infinities is a stronger thing, and you should divorce it from the baryon and symmetry thing. Uh-huh. Which is just probably just BSM physics that you, it's becoming, you know. Well, if protons do decay because of BSM physics, right. yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't negate this uh, topology. Right, yeah, I see. It doesn't do that. Uh, but, um, but I fail to see, if I have a fermion, a fermion world line, don't think it can just disappear. I mean, the only, the only thing that can't disappear are things that are guaranteed, things that correspond to conservation laws. What about angular momentum being conserved? That's, an, that's, that's a conserved quantity. Yeah. Uh, it comes out of... The fermion world line spin a half, so it can't disappear in seven angular momentum, right? Um... Well, I mean, we believe that uh, our standard model of uh, cosmology is we start out with something which could be essentially a pure inflaton field. has no fermions in it whatsoever. And, and then we end up with the universe we see today. Are you saying that's not consistent? But when the inflaton decays, this uh, that's the right way. Yeah, that's the way that so the way they generate fermion world lines that have a starting point. Right. They weren't there when they're there. And that can still conserve angular momentum. Um Yeah, I mean because it's because every fermion is balanced by a I mean it's it, in most of these models it's B minus L symmetry. So 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 I mean I create but there are also models without B minus L symmetry, okay. right. and, and, it, and, it, and I think it works. I mean. But B minus, so if you create a quark, you have to create another quark or a lepton with it. Right, yeah. Okay. That is not, that, the, the word line just zigs, zigs like that, right? Yeah. It's continuous. There isn't a Fermian word line which has an end point, a boundary. Right. And that's what I think I'm saying here, that they don't, word lines don't have an end point or a start point in the zigzag sense. Um, oh yeah, so actually this was a couple of years ago I saw a paper by Torsten Asselmeyer and Lieber and, uh, and I, I, I wrote to him and he wrote back a nice, a nice letter um, and I put it here to read but I, what he's saying is that the, um, he proposes the universe is a three sphere with positive gravity and positive energy. And that my anti universe is a hyperbolic three manifold, which he suggests a homology three sphere. Now it's getting out of my out of my uh, out of my knowledge. It's so negative gravity and negative energy. So who's so which is you and which is who? Those people is Jersey Kroll and No no, I mean he proposes. Who is he? Um, Torsten Asamai. All right, so I it's Torsten proposes. I could read it from here. He says, okay, I had the chance to look at it. As far as I understand your model, the universe, the anti-universe, is created by a vacuum fluctuation. I agree with your continuous world line hypothesis. Then you use Feynman's idea of antiparticles going back in time to identify the endpoints of the universe to you and mine to you. Then you will get closed time loops. Okay. But I do not find any hints for your spatial topology. So let me discuss the situation from the point of view of our last paper, which I have noted. Assume the spatial component is a three sphere, it's a closed universe, with you and anti you. Everything's fine. The universe starts from the Big Bang, and you can identify you and anti you later. The whole space time is smooth with no extra topological transitions. The 
problem is only if your universe is a free torus, then you will obtain a non-smooth evolution after the Big Bang. Your argumentation of total energy seems to imply it. But let me propose another kind of model. Spatial components but, well, let's, can, Do we understand that, that sentence? The problem is only if your universe is a three torus, then you will obtain a non-smooth evolution after the Big Bang. I mean, a three torus is, you know, if you'd like to spatially felt flat. But I don't see what that has to do with non-smooth ev evolution. But it, it's local, it's like, it resembles a Euclidean space at every point, right? Even if it's a torus. Right. But I mean, why, but a, a three sphere is also, why does that imply non-smooth evolution? You mean why torus not sphere? No, no, so the problem is only if your universe is a three torus, then you will obtain non-smooth evolution. I don't see why a three torus, a three sphere or a three hyperbola also don't include non-smooth evolution. Yeah, I, I don't understand that statement. I didn't understand that either. And maybe if you're trying to say is it like number of spatial components should be like let's say three in the polydimensional. It's not the number, it's about the curvature. Because it goes on to say the spatial component of you is a three sphere. It goes on to say, and your empty is a hyperbolic three manifold. You propose a homology three sphere, a closed space with negative curvature and thus negative total energy. There are examples of hyperbolic homology three spheres allowing a smooth evolution from the Big Bang. The sum of the two energies can be chosen from zero. Secondly, if the hyperbolic homology three sphere is chosen in such a manner starting from the Big Bang, you can identify it with the three sphere by a smooth map and obtain your model. Okay, the U and U and U are not symmetric, but CP is also bionetic. In summary, only the three torus spatial component is ruled out, but it's much more possible. So yeah, I didn't you know, I didn't follow this too much go further because but um, I think I'm at a three this this uh, hyperbolic, hyperbolic three manifold is all spatial, all three spatial components are negatively curved, right? So in our, in our case, it's all positively curved, in their case also mean somehow they, they can match together. And, I, and, I, and I'm thinking, but maybe it's wrong, but when the universe is so big um, that the curvature has become flat and they match. Well, I mean, if you think about the sitter space, if you, if you look at the, I mean, so the, sit, the sitter space could be flat, curved, positively or negatively curved, depending on how you slice it. Yeah. But if you slice it so that it's positively curved, then it, it undergoes a, a minimum size. So it has an expansion and a contract, a contracting and an expanding phase, which is just what you want. Yeah. So it seems like the three, the positive curvature, you know, would sort of, you know, they say that, you know, would sort of trivial topology. Maybe you could take a look at this paper that they, yeah, it's like, I don't know, like many of these things, I didn't understand it. Um, and there's all sorts of other ideas around which, um, I put, I put one in here, which is, this is now, you know, last month, basically, this year, June, our universe from the cosmological constant. We're talking about a bouncing universe, and this seems to be, as described, we've by weak quantum cosmology, blah, 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 blah. Uh, um, So I think we see more things in the preprints about, um, about a non-singular big bounce test with dark matter. These people who uh, say that uh, you measure dark matter masses and cross-sections, then you can say something about the big bounce. And this is another one from, from very recently. California, I don't know these people, University of Planet Space Time, I can't see. It's just, I've just picked out a couple of things there. So that was what I had there. Okay, so um, lots of feedback, and uh, I have to think about it. But I would welcome, because I don't remember all your points, but Well, I 
have some general question about your basic um, hypothesis no infinity. There is a one infinity which I think you cannot just simply get rid of. It's infinity of all possible laws of nature. So the question which could be asked to all this stuff is what selected this what what selected or who or what selected the specific set of laws of nature for your universe or for multiverse if there is finite number of all possible universe then the number of laws of nature is also finite I am I'm asking what sort of source selected that set of laws of nature among all possible infinite laws of nature, which are realized in the universe or in the multiple. The number of thinkable laws of nature is infinite. Is it? Yes? I, I mean, it's, a still, it's a still mathematical. I guess in no, his no. statement, he tried to say that like there is no, let's say, observable infinity. It's like some, let's well. say, energy, yeah, mass. I understand this, but, I understand, but I think there, there is one more infinity which should be considered in this respect. Well, it's it's not physics. But it's, it's not, not physics. physics. It's not no, 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 no. Like, in the same sense, you can say, okay, so I, 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 I'm asking, two, three, I think four, I'm two, asking two. a legitimate question. Why? We do have these laws of nature which we have. It's, by the way, a question of, uh, of uh, John Miller. Why these laws of nature, not others? What selected this specific set of laws of nature, not something else? Well, I, 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 okay, I think, again, that's not physics, but philosophy, but so is a lot of this. But what I translate your question as being in this multiverse where I had. I, I said you can have 10 to 100 virtual fluctuations of universes, but not an infinite number. And you're not saying, an infinite, not infinite yes. number. Yes. But, but here we have infinity. I don't. I, I don't. A number of mathematical I, mathematical forms is infinite. Yes. No, no. I don't see how you say that. You, you may, whatever, imagine that you have some finite, you, you selected somehow a finite set of possible laws of nature. Now I, I imagine one more term in your equation. One more. Not, not there yet. You have, say, derivative up to order 100 or 1,000 or 1 million. I imagine adding derivative one more order more. I don't even know how you can count the number of multi No, it's an infinite things. Number of general sets infinite. and infinitable sets. Like the set can be in infinitely big, but countable. It's it is countable. I mean, yeah. It is Probably countable, but infinite. Like set of multiple is countable. I mean, you know, so. how many values of alpha could there be between 1 over 137 and 1 over 138. There's a countably infinite. Or how many points are there in your universe? There's, yeah, but there's I'm a about you're assuming it's a continuous manifold. So there's, there's lots of infinities everywhere. Oh, yes. And, and, the, and the one you're talking about is particularly troublesome. <laughs> <laughs> Number of infinite mathematical forms. Number of mathematical forms is infinite. So, I think the question, this is the question which we philosophically at least have to keep in mind. And uh, if, you, if you're if going to get rid of all the infinities, you have to do something with this infinity. Infinity of all possible platonic forms, if you like. But as, 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 Tim, 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 Tim saying, I mean, this, you're talking about an infinite infinity in mathematics, not in physics, right? All possible worlds. I mean, I don't know why we call it mathematics or physics. All possible worlds. Number of thinkable worlds is infinite. Number of thinkable worlds is infinite. Number of thinkable laws of nature is infinite. What selected this specific laws of nature? It's John Miller question. I'm just repeating it. Oh, you're saying in the sense of, like, it's an alpha could, it's a continuous possibility of matter, but it's actually two different No, this but, is but, 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 also form, but right? you're talking about qual qualitatively different types of laws of nature. I mean, how many do we know? Are we know the conservation of energy and momentum and that. And maybe we, we know for, half a dozen. For, for many of them, maybe the energy or, uh, or momentum doesn't have uh, any uh, any meaning because I mean, the laws of nature know. could be very different. Yeah, and sometimes say, momentum is not really momentum. Like, in, no, let's momentum. say, if you have a motion in a spiral, you have not the angular momentum and not like longitudinal. You have some mixture of them, which is 
still can be called momentum and special coordinates, but in general... There is a paper of um, Tedmark, uh, by, uh, former PhD student of uh, John Dillon, uh, about no, the laws no, no. of nature. Tedmark? Tedmark, a former PhD student of Charles Salk. I think he was... I, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also a former PhD student of Charles Salk. Uh, I can pass the point. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I heard about. So, uh, that um, maybe not PhD student, but he worked with uh, John Miller. Maybe, I don't know. Oh, okay, just maybe that matters so much. But uh, uh, there is a paper of uh, Max Tegmark, yes, that's about maybe 10 or 15 years old paper uh, about uh, related exactly to this question. Why do we have this, not other, laws of nature? And what laws of nature are possible? And his statement in this paper is that uh, uh, whatever is thinkable mathematically is realized somehow physically. It's a statement no, of that's that's Max Tegmark. But that's a hypothesis, right? No, yeah, exactly. It's not a but at least it's, it's the, question, the question is considered. So there is infinity of possible thinkable laws of nature. How do we thinkable, but not necessarily realizable? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, no not, 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 not said that realize. It's the hypothesis of Tegmark that all of them are somehow realized. So I'm not saying this. You have to go now, but <laughs> yeah. 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 were you going to say something more? Yes, but, but at least there is. Uh, I, might, I might have if I had more time. <laughs> all right, let's, let's next, next time. Next time. Okay. Can we, can, right. can Albert say something next week? So, <laughs> have you ever heard about any Thanks. like See theories? You. Like, you know, that let's say our world, it's uh, probably. Let's say there is a, some five-dimensional world, right? Let's say with four spatial and one time component. And in this world, there is a black hole. And when this black hole, like, evaporating or exploding or something like that happening, like this horizon, that's uh, our real world. Have you ever heard about such a hypothesis? I'm not quite sure about that. But so, so, so I mean, there I, is certain I, ideas which say that, like, there is a like, bigger world, let's yeah. say this five or six Eight dimensions, yeah. and whatever, and the our world is, let's say, a horizon of expansion of some like black hole or something like that. I saw a couple articles uh, last two years, like very similar to each other, with, you know, when people talking about such ideas, and yeah. then they somehow, like, it give you a little bit more considerations about what time and how it should be considered in this sense, because, mm. like, I mean, basically, they're saying that uh, our world is literally like more dimensional than we can observe, but some of them not just hidden or like folded Science, in some, yeah. but they literally some just process we're following in yeah. you know space or whatever. So yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of a lot of people I think because when I you know, understood that Einstein said maybe the world is close three sphere, and, uh, little, is that in an extra dimension? And I don't think it has to be. Um, I mean, I put it in outer space time, but that's 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 different. Um, one thing maybe related to that, though, I was thinking of this. I have the universe and anti-universe as a pair creation event, and they're separated, uh, not in three space, but they're separated in a different dimension, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and maybe the separation is exact, is very small, actually. Um, and technically, they even can be at the same location at, let's say, three-dimensional. Euclidean space. The separation can be in at l even one dimension is enough to separate them completely. So I mean, let's say if you take a look on my hands like this, they're at the same point, but they definitely, you know, separated like completely and independent from each other. Even one degree of freedom can give you the complete separation of systems. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, sure how meaningful it is to talk about the distance between the universe and the universe in, in this extra dimension. But if, if uh, you know, we, we have this idea of, of brains now with particles living on one brain, and then the gravity could actually be the connection between the brains, right? So, um, and that they said it's why gravity is so so weak um, compared with other forces. Now, if if gravity could, if, if the anti-universe is actually very close to ours, but just in this extra dimension, then could we feel the effects of gravity, of the antimatter, of the anti-stars, right? Anti-galaxies, anti-stars, anti-black holes. And um, if both spaces are totally closed, then the gravitational 
uh, interaction between them will not be there because that would be leaking out of the closed spaces. But um, you know, you, you could wonder whether um, they could be connected in some sense. For example, uh, here's, here's, here's one sort of sheet, if you like, and here's a black hole, and, and matter's falling into it in our universe, and here's the corresponding close by sheet of the act, and, 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 and you could have a, a connection between them like that, where from the point of view of the anti-universe, matter will be falling into this, and then uh, with, is it falling in, or is matter coming out, like, yeah, yeah. In, you know, like a right. white hole? We don't see white holes, but I mean, it, it would be an interesting astronomical survey to look for evidence for um, uh, gravitating objects like, like stars in the, in the other dimension that could affect us. Mm -hmm. I don't know how systematic one's done, done that. Looking at looking at looking at uh, millions of stars and looking for evidence that some of them are jumping or even disappearing, you know, stuff like that. But, I mean, there there are a lot of there are a lot of things, different ways of this. But the, the one thing that most people do not say, except I mean, I don't know other people saying that let's make time just one closed loop. That's it, you know, because um, they have bouncing universes. Steinhardt has two brains that come together every 10 to 20 years or something like that and mm -hmm. reform. And I said, well, why don't you um, identify one of those with the next one and that, make that close time? And, um, well, he, he says, I suppose perhaps, but it doesn't mean anything. It just, it's just my aversion to infinity in physics that makes me want to have it close. So what do you think about recursion, if time is cyclic? Recursion? Like, does, let's say, Poincaré theorem of recursion holds, in this case, for our universe? Can you explain what that is? I don't know what that is. Uh, there is a theorem by Poincaré. Yeah. It's called the Poincaré recursion theorem. So, originally, it's stated for classical physics, and it says that, like, if you have a bounded system, which like have natural boundaries, so like your potential, you know, is strong enough to hold everything in the finite space. Mm -hmm. Then it says that like your system, whatever your in initial conditions are, will come mm -hmm. back to exactly the same position, or either in any like delta uh, closeness. Yeah, yeah. In, 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 any, in any small vicinity. Like the best example of this is a list of the figure. If you have a two signs, yeah. let's say whenever you start, you either come exactly to the same point, and it's a like yeah. very bad scenario, which means that like let's say our uni our fate will be exactly the same every time. Like we, in next universe, we will sit in, in the same room talking about the same things. Like all atoms will be exactly at precise position. Well, otherwise, like. It means that uh, we will be very close to this no, point, but, but <laughs> no, 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 no. It, 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 it will be the same on the locally. Like, globally, it can be completely different evolution. Like, it just means that, like, one time we can be very close to this moment, but it doesn't mean that, like, future or past can be extrapolated. Uh, right. I, I think, okay, I just don't say I didn't know what it's called, but... There's a couple of things. One, one thing is that you may have to wait a very long time. Uh, I won't say an infinite amount of time, but it also depends on the number of the number of elements in your system, right? If you have so if you two if you have two or three atoms running around, then uh, the probability of them coming back to almost the same configuration, but never exactly, because exact implies zero difference between them. And you know we know quantum mechanically that doesn't make sense either, right? But if you had a box with 10 to the 25 atoms in, then you're basically in that kind of, like, uh, <coughs> the, the, the phase space you're in has got 25 times 3 dimensions. Okay. But I mean, you know, what is very interesting about this recursion theory is that, like, technically, if you will think about what is the difference between two of these scenarios, the one when you go to exactly the same position, mm -hmm. and another one when you will be, you know, coming very close to each yeah. other, Technically, it's uh, all about 
let's say, frequencies in your system, if all of them is commensurate, then like that's a one scenario. You come in exactly to the same position. It's like a list of, list of figures with uh, ratios like 15 and 24. It's some complicated figure, but you know it's close because your frequencies is commensurate. If they incommensurate, let's say one of them is rational number, another one irrational, or both of them is irrational, mm -hmm. then your system, you know, will never go back to the same position. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can continue, like, the further it's my own thoughts, but like, what I'm thinking about, in a case, if you exclude all physical infinities from your theory, then it means that everything in the universe is played on a grid, like some sort of grid. Because if there is no infinities, there is no infinitesimals. If there is no infinitesimals, it should be some sort of grid. If you have some sort of grid, it means that like all frequencies kind of can be commensurated. Because like in reality, it means that there is no irrational numbers. All numbers are rational. Like all lengths, all sizes can be compared to each other and represented as a natural like number. And uh, you do exactly. Yeah. And your grid, uh, your, grid, your grid is not a regular matrix. Uh, I don't think it should be, be it has right. something to do right. with regular or irregular lattices. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not sure about this yeah. yet, that's a nice question. But uh, I don't have an answer, I thought about it, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And then it looks very bad, because like in this sense it means that we will, I mean, let's say I don't want to accept even theory when we come in very close to where we was, like in next universes, because it just sounds weird for me. But I definitely not accepting the universe which coming exactly to the same, you know, position. Yeah, no, and uh, yeah, problem of Nietzsche. Actually. Yeah, and again, I'm not sure 100 percent, but I guess that the Poincaré theorem of recursions can be extended to quantum physics as well. It's not just a classical thing. And the improvement of this theorem is uh, extremely simple and straightforward. It's just a geometrical consideration. Suppose you have a set which is bounded, and you have like some your system which is some ge geometrical like point, and then after the evolution, if you say that it never comes back, means that there is no intersection, which means that union of all sets after each iteration uh, equal infinity, which is in controversy with uh, finite, you know. That's a whole theory that seems like it's a five lines. But it's very, so powerful that uh, for me, it sounds very weird when you reject, I mean, when you reject infinities, you immediately put your world in a grid. And if no, you put- I don't know what you mean by grid, actually. What do you mean by grid? Finite number of states. You have finite yes. number of all possible states. They could be counted. Very big number, but finite number. And then it will repeat. But it's discrete, non continuous. No, no more continuous. No more continuous, yeah, yeah. discrete. Discrete, yeah, but not discrete. in a regular lattice, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, it's important that discrete, uh, finite number number of states. Your system has See, a finite I mean, number of states. So, so consider, consider, consider the present body, I mean, I think physics terms has got the, the, the volume of the visible universe. And a Planck body, and take the ratio. How many Planck bodies are there? In the Huge body? number, but, but here, yeah, but if it's a finite and countable, it's finite and countable. Although, but then, uh, although it's, you... inc it's increasing all the time as the universe expands. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, after so you circle, if you are returning to exactly the same situation, no such thing as exactly the same situation. It doesn't exist. Same, exactly the same situation. No, if you so have a finite, finite number of states, the Poincaré theorem immediately prove you that. That's absolutely yeah, anti-intuitive. Uh, actually, I mean, if it no, 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 if it comes exactly to the same position, that's a finite time, and it's a finite by theorem. If it comes to very close position, then yeah. I mean, that's the same problem. Initially, Poincaré was thinking about this when he was considering like the room of gas, and like you separate it with a like wall. Like on the right side, you have vacuum, nothing else. And on the left side, you have like you know your atoms. If you remove the like wall, if you un if you will consider the system very accurately, like without thermodynamics, because thermodynamics doesn't give you full picture. It's just average everything and give you kind of bullshit answer. Because like if you will consider the system from the point or a point of view, you will immediately find that the system will come back to the same position or very close, which means that your gas, of course, will full classical. Yes, so but classical. But as soon as you go to quantum, then you know there's uncertainty in the position and momentum of the part of the atoms of the gas. But and, then uh, you can. Uh, but but uh, that's what I said. I'm not sure 100 percent. But I know that Poincaré theorem somehow can be extended to quantum physics too. 
then you're not talking about like those positions anymore. It's yeah. probably you need to consider it wave functions, but it still uh, works in quantum physics in just a little bit different manner. <laughs> I think it is even more general because you uh, might exclude all the infinities from the theory. And then you exclude but the infinity. However, however, you describe your system, number of states is finite just by, by the virtue of yes. your uh, first hypothesis. Yes. And then uh, either your entire history is finite, and you're saying that my time started from zero and then to certain units to one or whatever it is. Uh, and then it, that's all. My time is finite, or my time is cyclic. And then the system will repeat itself exactly because number of all possible states is finite. Yeah, I, cannot, I, cannot, I, cannot, I take issue with, with your statement about two possible. And I've read this too, people say, there's two possibilities. I think maybe Horton said this. Either time is finite with a beginning and an end, or it's cyclic and has no end and it goes round and round and round. And mine's a third possibility. It doesn't go round and round. It's, that's it. One, one loop. That doesn't mean things are repeating itself. It doesn't mean we're going to be here in 20 billion years yeah, but, again. But this means that time is finite. If it is one time thing. is finite. Mm -hmm. Time is finite, but it doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. But still, so there's a the question, is it discrete or not? Time. Is it discrete or not? Well, because if it's discrete, it might be countable. And then, like, it's a very it's crazy a huge picture of the world. Continue. Well, there I mean, is a, there's a minimum, there's a minimum, I think, there's a minimum uh, realistic time, which is the Planck time. But uh, that doesn't mean to say that the universe has got a grid of Planck times. It means that once you get down to the Planck time, um, Usually small numbers are uh, yeah, excluded. Yeah, you, right? you excluded them you initially excluded. when you said like the reason of infinities. Yeah. So it means that literally everything in time and space, like on a certain grid, it can be curved, it can be very complicated topologically, it's, it shouldn't be Euclidean, like four dimensional space, it can be any crazy manifold, like a plane battle or whatever. But if it's discrete, it gives you a big problem of recursion. Like, it means that, like, you kind of... Yeah, doesn't recursion, to get back to the same initial state, or the same state, you have a certain state at a certain time, to get back there requires a certain time. And yes, maybe and the universe doesn't have that time. The time is finite. Yes. The total time is, you know, 10 or 20 years. Could we, could, we really, could we really separate these two options? And how? Uh, infinite number of repetitions, or just a single loop? We, we would be able to do it, if we will assume some external observer. Then for external observer, whoever he is, he could see your is an infinite loops in time from his super time, super space position, uh, could distinguish this infinite number of loops from a, just a single loop. But if, if you would exclude this external observer, then how could you distinguish between single loop and infinite number of, of loops? Mm -hmm. How is it possible? Right. So the external observer would see, for example, that if in 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 our one loop thing, okay, is that the that the time uh, after this after this big crunch, big bang occurs, then the universe evolves differently. It won't be exactly the same, right? Because of all quantum fluctuations and everything. So we won't expect us to be there in the next loop mm -hmm. round. Um, but in my view. Uh, it's not like that. It's, 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 it's just once. It's, it's like laid out there. The sheet's laid out. You know? mm -hmm. It's like it's not like if you go on a journey around the Earth, you keep coming back to America, America, America. There's many Americas there. It's only one. It's just that's it. It's, now, but I think this is a philosophical point, mm -hmm. or it's maybe maybe it's just a point of uh, a view or something that uh, that it only it's just one time loop. That's it. But you need an external observer to distinguish one time loop from infinite number of loops. How can we distinguish otherwise? Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> we need God. <laughs> Without God, you cannot resolve. <laughs> and then imagine this God who is looking at just one circle. Then um, just seeing this movie, he saw this movie just one time. And then what he, what, what he would do after that? If you seriously assume hypothesis of God. He saw this movie just one time, and then what? To sleep? <laughs> in no. number of times. When, when people think, and a lot of people think, what happened before the Big Bang? Or what's going to happen in the infinite future? Okay. I don't have those questions. They don't bother me. I don't lie awake at night wondering about that, because I have an idea that, that's, that it's like this. It's like a loop. From and, 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 infinite, view. and you wouldn't have an infinite number of cycles. 
because an infinite number cipher doesn't make sense either. I mean, I would have in the next universe everything exactly the same except for oh, spelling mistakes that we've had before. <laughs> you know, I mean, no infinities like that. You know, people talk about you know how many monkeys would it take to type round a neural typewriter in the white words of Shakespeare? You know, and they say, well, if you had infinite time, it would happen. But I don't know. What about if you calculate the decimals of pi? They're infinite, right? Because they're rational. At some place, you're going to have a string of 20 zeros. But that's exactly the problem I mentioned. If you live on a grid, there is no irrational numbers at all. Only rational numbers do exist because you have, let's say, yeah. a minimum distance between two right. like grid states, right. Right. and then all lengths can be measured just in a sense of rational numbers. Yeah. And that's a Exactly the problem you mentioned. If you will take a look on a very simple difference equations, something like quadratic or mm -hmm. even some linear, but which have some discontinuities, like you will see that rational numbers have one type of behavior, irrational has completely different one. And uh, we know that in real world it looks like we have only irrational numbers because uh, on a like let's say unity interval, the measure of irrational numbers is one and measure of rational numbers is zero. So it looks a little, I mean, just the probability to hit any rational initial position is just zero, just by definition of probability, while the probability of hit any rational number is uh, vice versa. It's uh, exactly unity, like you will hit a pi, I mean, let's say, fractional number or, or, or pi on the unit circle or whatever. And that's very interesting because from one point of view, I completely agree that like you kind of there is internal desire to reject all infinities in physics mm -hmm. because they really do not exist. At least we never observe them after right now. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if you take in this hypothesis and uh, put in your world on a grid, then you immediately exclude like even irrational numbers, which is uh, sounds very crazy because it looks like only irrational numbers do exist in uh, real life. It's like with a pendulum, like. If it's all exactly upside down, it's a rational number. It's some like one or zero. But if it's slightly light or left, it's a irrational number. Any other initial position, which is infinitely many around. And you know that you never will have pendulum staying upside down. Mm -hmm. It may stay for a second, for two, three, mm -hmm. but eventually right. it means that your initial condition cannot be set it like for some, you know, exact number. And that's another very interesting question I was thinking about. But and when you talk about the pendulum being upside down, it's falling in one particular direction, which is a set breaking a symmetry, right? And, and then uh, people talk about the maximum hat potential for the inflatory universe, right? So the, the vacuum was in an unstable position, and then uh, and then it it, uh, it it ran down the hill and generating the infant plant field and so uh -huh. on. Anyway, we think we're on the wrong time, but that. Oh, I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, 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 so,